Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution and the National Constitution Center, as those of you who have been here before know, is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And I love to recite our beautiful congressional charter, but I cannot imagine a more fitting group to uh, recite it with than our great co-sponsors of tonight's program, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court Commission on Judicial Independence. The commission deserves a round of applause because it also has an inspiring mission. Quote, to foster a better understanding of the role of the court, to raise public awareness of the importance of a strong, independent judiciary in a free society, and monitor threats on judicial independence in Pennsylvania and around the nation. So you see that our two missions are related in important ways. And on a personal level, I'm so thrilled that this program is taking place. I think I'd been on the job just a few weeks when Judge Jones and Ned Madeira, both members of the Pennsylvania Commission on Judicial Independence, came to me and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a program at the Constitution Center where citizens could hear judges talking candidly about uh, their roles as judges and how they apply the Constitution in their courtrooms. And there's this great new book coming out, uh, and it's uh, edited by Joel Cohn, who had the good idea of convincing some of the most distinguished judges in the country to speak candidly to him, so let's bring them all to the Constitution Center. And here they are, and it's gonna be a phenomenal program. So thank you so much for joining. Just a few uh, shout outs for upcoming programs before we start. Uh, we have a thrilling series of programs coming up over the next couple of weeks at the Constitution Center. The annual Templeton Lecture is gonna take place on December 1st with Charles Murray talking about his fascinating new book, Coming Apart. Uh, we have a conversation with my friend and editor Franklin Four from the New Republic on December 2nd. The New Republic turns 100 this week. I've had the privilege of being the legal affairs editor there for a long time, and Frank and I are going to talk about the greatest hits from the New Republic's distinguished 100-year history. On December 9th, Ken Edelman is coming to talk about his wonderful book on Reagan at Reykjavik. And finally, on December 15th, which is Bill of Rights Day. We are having an extraordinary array of programs, including four books on the Bill of Rights, uh, biographies of John Marshall on the First Amendment. I'm gonna moderate some of them, and my friend Judge David Wecht, who's here tonight, is gonna moderate some of the others. It is gonna be a blockbuster day of Bill of Rights programming. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. We will be taking some audience questions, and our great town hall staff will circulate note cards, so please jot them down halfway through the show and uh, we will bring them up to Joel who will um, ask them. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Chief Justice Ronald D. Castile. <laughs> ju ju Justice Castile uh, took office as Chief Justice of Pennsylvania on January 7th, 2008. He was first elected as a Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in 1993 was retained by the voters for a second 10-year term in 2003. This year, uh, he's reached the age of mandatory retirement to all of our regret, and he will retire from the Supreme Court at the end of the year. Prior to his service on the Supreme Court, he served in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office for two decades. He was chief of the career criminal unit, and he was deputy district attorney. Please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Ronald Castile. Good evening, everyone. Come on, come on. Good, <laughs> good evening, everyone. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Uh, it's great to be at the, the uh, Constitution Center, a, uh, a tremendous place, a tremendous organization of education. If you come here during the day, you'll see all kinds of kids running all over the place, and they're finally learning something about our government and our Constitution. It's a, a really great addition to the uh, city of Philadelphia. As uh, Jeff has said, my tenure as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania concludes December 31st. Uh, Pennsylvania's Constitution currently calls for mandatory retirement 
of all judges at the end of the year in which they turned 70 years of age. Uh, my 70th birthday, by the way, unless if you want to send a card, was March 16th, 19. Uh, <laughs> uh, my bel uh, it, the card will be belated, but I'll appreciate it anyway. So, uh, my seat, the seat held by, presently held by Justice Coriel Stevens, and now the seat held, formerly held by former. Justice Seamus McCaffrey will be permanently filled in the elections of 2015. Some here, I realize, would debate the merit of the judicial election process, and I might be one of those individuals, but that's a topic for another place and another evening. I want to briefly explain the role of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's Commission on Judicial Independence, for I believe the Commission's role, that of the organized bar and others' vigilance, will be keenly important in this next year as judicial elections are held for three open seats on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and for seats in the lower courts in the counties and for appellate courts. The commission is apolitical. As exemplified by tonight's program, the commission tries to shed light on the, on the purpose and value of judicial independence and on how our courts work and why they work the way they do. Some have said that the judiciary is the weakest branch of government, and it also is the least understood branch of our government. If so, then the commission's role in collaboration with many others, including the media, opinion leaders, and the bar, is critical in educating the public as to the importance of an independent judiciary. You and tonight's audience, including those watching at home, are obviously among those who are interested in a court system that is free from improper influence of fear or favor, as the phrase goes. And so allow me to note that Pennsylvania's judicial elections next year, like others across the country, are ripe for confusion, misinformation, and outside influence spawned by single issue interests. Those interests, if I'm accurate, will be liberally fueled with campaign money, and most of their influence will be directed at Supreme Court races. Assessment by others, as evidenced by various polls that we're all familiar with, suggests that the high courts are where the pernicious influence of money is most focused and where it is most detrimental to public perception of the courts. The heart of judicial independence is the ability of a jurist to decide cases and controversies without influence from those whose purpose is to advance a singular agenda. Respectfully, I suggest that next year you should support those judicial candidates who are prepared to make the hard choices and to make those choices for the right reasons. More pointedly, be watchful next year that candidates' campaigns are civil and appropriately substantive. Be wary next year if money becomes a driving force in the election and be attentive to those who advance clear and cogent facts and analysis about the candidates who will be seeking judicial office. Finally, next year, if you're among those who observe, assess, and report on judicial elections, as some of you are here, redouble your efforts to make the electoral process meaningful for the voters who will be deciding these seats. I often recall the wisdom of the 19th century preacher Harriet, Beecher, uh, Harriet Ward Beecher. He was the brother of the famed author and abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote the, the, uh, the, the book Uncle Tom's Cabin. Beecher said, quote, if you take all of the robes of all of the good judges in all of the world, they would not be enough to cover the iniquity of one corrupt judge. That aphorism is as accurate today as it was when it was penned in the 19th century. And we have unfortunately seen examples of that in the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now for the next 75 minutes, you will hear the experiences of five of America's finest jurists as they answer the tough question put to, to put to them by attorney and author Joel Cohen. I believe you will see the importance of how these judges sitting here on this stage address the challenge of adjudicating sometimes controversial cases that they have handled that demonstrates their commitment to fair and impartial justice under the law. 
We will, con Attorney Cohen will lead this discussion, but I have to tell you, we can only be here for 75 minutes or we might have to pay overtime if we go over. So that's, <laughs> so thank you very much and welcome all to this uh, really enlightening discussion and we welcome the panelists and Arthur Cohen to, uh, t to the Constitution Center. Thank you all very much. Well, I guess it falls on me to introduce the panel, but before I do that, um, I should say I just learned that Judge Castile's and my birthday was the exact same day. My, my mother, my late mother, always told me it was a, a great moment in the world, and now I find out she's talking about Judge Castile. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm told to make it short and sweet, and so I'll introduce very briefly the panel. Judge Nathaniel Jones, retired of the Sixth Circuit. Judge Rendell of the Third Circuit. Judge Cleland, of the, a senior judge of the Court of Common Pleas, Judge Rakoff of the Southern District of New York, and Judge Jones of the Middle District of Pennsylvania. Uh, the book I wrote, Blindfolds Off, which I guess was the impetus for this discussion, was intended to really get into the heads of the judges um, that I interviewed. Um, one of the interviews I conducted was with a Judge Vaughn Walker, who is retired now of San Francisco in the District Court, he decided the same-sex marriage case that ultimately uh, went to the Supreme Court and, and basically was the forerunner of the many cases that have um, uh, held what was Proposition 8 in uh, uh, California unconstitutional. During my interview with Judge Walker, and I didn't know him before I met him in San Francisco in his office, um, uh, I started asking him somewhat invasive questions because after um, he left the bench, he acknowledged publicly that he was gay, and it was sort of relevant to what was going on in his head when he decided that same-sex marriage was, uh, the ban against same-sex marriage was unconstitutional. So I asked him some tough questions, maybe provocative questions, saying, you understand, Judge, I'm trying to get inside your head, and Judge uh, Walker looked at me kind of wryly and said, you know, there's only room for one of us in there. <laughs> So we may find out if there's room for only one of us in the head of each of these judges. I thought I'd start off by talking um, about an experience I had some years ago. Um, when the Iraq war was at its uh, height of unpopularity, I was attending with probably 1,500 lawyers um, a dinner uh, of the Federal Bar Council in New York. I think it was at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Judge Rakoff, you were probably there. And the guest of honor, the keynote speaker was Mario Cuomo, former governor of New York. Now, Governor Cuomo had gotten somewhat older and his voice wasn't quite as booming uh, as it was at the 1984 convention in San Francisco, but it was booming that day. And he basically lectured 1,500 uh, lawyers and judges, all of the Second Circuit who were there that day, that it was the obligation of the bar to do whatever it could to use their good offices with the judges in the, in the room to declare the president's use of the war power unconstitutional, or arrogation of the war power unconstitutional. People were somewhat stunned, and Cuomo was quite a speaker, as you know. There's a judge at every table, and there was a judge sitting at the table that my law firm um, had. He'll go nameless, but I leaned over to him and said to him, well, judge, are you going to declare the Iraq war unconstitutional? And he looked at me and went like this, rubbing his palms together, and he said, just bring me a case. <laughs> so my friend, Judge Jones, we didn't meet until this afternoon, but I did a little homework on you, and I found that before Jimmy Carter basically appointed you uh, to the Sixth Circuit, you held many important positions, but particularly, you were the general counsel appointed by that great civil rights worker, um, Roy Wilkins, to be general counsel of probably the greatest civil rights organization in the century, the NAACP. And you did in those, I believe, 10 years as general counsel, what you could to fulfill the promise of, Board of uh, Brown versus Board of Education and try to turn around that with all deliberate speed to accomplish what needed to be done, particularly in the North, in terms of desegregating schools and the like. It seems to me, if I were you, and had that background and career, 
when I would get onto a bench, thank God nobody's ever appointed me to the bench, but if I got onto the bench, it would be my goal, because that's my personality, to finish the job, to do what I can and do on the court what maybe I couldn't do as a lawyer. And I would be saying to myself, maybe to the world at large, bring me that cake. My question to you, Judge, is how can it be that a judge can get on to a court where he or she has so much important uh, abilities to, uh, to conduct the, the, the forcible fulfillment of the law and not have that in their background strongly influencing what they're going to do when those cases come before him or her? Well, there's such a thing as a record. I was on an appellate court and uh, the cases that would come to the Sixth Circuit came there on a record that had been made. If the record was sufficient to uh, demonstrate that the action of the defend, defend, if this was a Board of Education uh, defending, that its, its history and its record created, maintained a system of dual schools or uh, a system of uh, disparate schools, then that would be state action and it would justify the uh, invocation of the uh, uh, jurisdiction of the court. There were cases in the, uh, in the North in the 50s and 60s, in the late 50s and, and early 60s, in which uh, the defendants, the school districts, the states, contended that the conditions being complained of were the result of happenstance. That if there were uh, disparate uh, assignment schemes, if the schools were in racially imbalanced, it all, it, it was just that way. It was a matter of choice. People of color chose to be together. Uh, what we had to do and what was done what I did in my litigation period, uh, when I was general counsel, we had to develop a record that would demonstrate that the conditions did not result from happenstance, but that they resulted from policies and practices of officials, school officials, housing officials, real estate uh, uh, and uh, operators and banks in combination, using the, um, the powers uh, of, of government uh, to shape the, the uh, school districts and the school officials drew lines to contain persons of color or, or uh, uh, white populations in discrete areas. Uh, I was instrumental and helpful in, in developing that body of jurisprudence. So when I was on the court, if a case came up and the record was sufficient, I knew what my responsibility was. I was only challenged once uh, by a, a defend by, by an, uh, an uh, appellate um, in a case because I uh, had an affiliation with the NACP and that I was black. That was a problem that a number of black judges had. Somehow there was a feeling that if you were black, you can't be fair, but yet a white judge <laughs> can be fair. And I know uh, in one instance, uh, uh, um, it never reached a, a critical point. Uh, we, were in the, we were in the roaming room, ready to go on the bench, and the clerk of the court came rushing into the room out of breath and told the presiding judge, he said, well, the, a motion was just filed by, uh, by a lawyer, the lawyer in, the, um, in this case, challenging uh, Judge Jones. He said, what's the basis of the motion? He said, well, he, he says that um, he, has, uh, uh, he had been, was with the NACP and he has a history of civil rights litigation. And the chief judge was, uh, presiding judge was Judge George Edwards from Detroit who was a tremendous judge. 
he says, and I said, uh, and I said, now, now what am I to do? Uh, we're about to go on the bench. He said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So we go on the bench, and that was the first case up. And uh, the judge says, well, uh, Judge Edwards said, well, we have a motion here we have to dispose of. Um, counsel, what's the basis of your motion? And he was very embarrassed, and he, he finally got it out. He said, oh, I see. He said, well, you know, uh, you may have heard of, a, of another judge of color by the name of Wade McCree. And Wade McCree later became Solicitor General and so forth. And he said, he was a judge in Michigan on the circuit court. And he, was, uh, he uh, drew a housing case, housing dis discrimination case. And there was an objection to him uh, hearing that case. He says, well, counsel, let me just ask you uh, a couple of questions. This is Judge McCree. He said, um, there are 37 judges on this court. I'm the only judge of color. If you can find any one of those 36 judges who will admit to having as much black blood as I have white blood, <laughs> then I'll, I'll recuse myself. <laughs> Motion was withdrawn. So Judge uh, Jones, let me uh, probe it a little further. And, and there's nobody in the room. It's just you and me. Okay, okay. all right, I'll turn to you. So <laughs> it seems to me that it would be hard for you, given, forget about the blackness. That's sort of a ridiculous argument to recuse a judge based on that. But based on the record of what you had done in your professional career for the NAACP, don't you bring to the table when you're sitting on the bench a mindset that might influence you in some way in terms of how you see the law when the law is sort of up for grabs in a particular decision. I understand the record sort of constrains you, but you want, might want to move the law in a direction that might be movable under the circumstances of what the precedents are. Well, being on a, on a, uh, on a an appellate court, uh, uh, there are uh, two other judges. Right. And you have to uh, be mindful of, a, of your uh, uh, of the, the obligation to attempt to persuade your colleagues to your position. And that's what we do in, in conference. We had a, um, just cite another case, um, we, we, there was a time when the Sixth Circuit led the, the, the country in a number of um, uh, judges of color. We had four African American judges on the, on the Sixth Circuit. And one day, uh, that one week, um, all th uh, three of the four judges constituted the panel. And the pa and and the one of the cases on the docket on this on this particular morning was a um, employment discrimination case. It had a terrible record. Nooses hung in the work in, in, in the locker room and. Uh, uh, messages uh, strewn on the uh, on the wall, and uh, uh, the the, the N word used constantly, and um, the employee did nothing about it, and so an employee complained and uh, it filed a uh, filed a Title VII suit. Well, when the lawyers uh, walked into court that morning and looked at that bench, <laughs> <laughs> they saw three black judges sitting up there. And the case was called, and the, law, and, and the counsel was really in a difficult situation. And we had to assure him in different ways that we recognized he didn't commit those acts that were the basis of the findings. Mm -hmm. He's there as a lawyer. And, and, if the, and, and in the briefs and in the record and the testimony, if the N-word was used and if all these other uh, uh, negatives were in the record, feel free to, to articulate it. You don't have to worry about uh, any, any backlash. And we had, to, we, had to curry, we, had, we had to take all kinds of steps to assure this counsel that he'd be treated fairly. Now, he didn't prevail, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 but, but 
they had a fair hearing. And uh, the, 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 um, that's one of those areas in which African American trial judges have had uh, early on had the greatest difficulty. That was assuring the public, ensuring the bar that, uh, that we could be fair, that we could be as fair in, toward white litigants as white judges were to black litigants. And so the mindset, uh, you step back and you realize you're an Article Three judge, you have uh, an obligation to, to do justice, you took an oath, and you have an obligation to, um, to be true to your oath. Uh, Judge Rendell, uh, Judge Jones said, among other things, that there's a duty or an obligation to try to convince uh, your colleagues on an appellate court who sit on the Third Circuit. I came across some case that you were involved in some years ago. Um, it's called Mellot. It was a 1998 decision, and it, it de uh, dealt with uh, an eviction as a result of a bankruptcy proceeding, and the eviction was sort of carried out by the marshals. And <laughs> sort of carried out. Sort of carried out. And the majority opinion was written by uh, now Justice Alito, and he was in favor of affirming a su summary judgment motion under these kind of facts, summary judgment motion brought by the people who were evicted. For qualified immunity. Correct. When, when the officers arrive at the Mellet's residence, they approach the house, and Deputy Marshal Hemer knocked on the front door. After Bunny Mellet answered the door, Hemer entered the house, pointed his gun right in her face, pushed her into a chair and kept his gun aimed at her for the remainder of the eviction. Deputy Marshal David Seich entered the house next, pumped around into the barrel of his sawed-off shotgun, pointed it out Wilkie Mellet and told him to sit down, not move, and keep his mouth shut. With respect to this encounter, there is evidence that the marshals were aware before the eviction that Wilkie Mellet was recovering from heart surgery. And it goes on, but I won't get into some more of those gory details, but you've got the picture. You dissented in the case, were in favor of denial of summary judgment motion, and you said this, Judge uh, Rendell, here where seven marshals detained and terrorized a family and friends and ransacked a home while carrying out an unresisted civil eviction, their conduct, which could be described as Gestapo-like, is even closer to the line, if not over the line, and you're talking about some mm -hmm. precedents there. Mm -hmm. um, Justice Alito, then Judge Alito, got some flack from Senator Kennedy in his confirmation proceeding <laughs> over this, mm -hmm. referring, in fact, that you referred to the conduct of these marshals as Gestapo-like. And I guess my question to you, and I'm not, not looking to uh, uh, poke Justice Alito uh, mm -hmm. in the nose, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how is it that two distinguished judges like yourself come to such diametrically different conclusions on facts mm -hmm. such as these? And, and maybe you can help illuminate that for us. Well, I think one thing you're getting at is we all come to judging with different perspectives. And we paint different pictures when we hear certain facts. Um, in hearing these facts, I painted a picture you know, of the gun going like this and how awful it would be to have the gun in your face, et cetera. Um, Sam, who was a prosecutor, um, looked at it from the standpoint of there were statements made that there were guns in the house, so the officers had to protect themselves. Um, you, you do come at it from different perspectives, and I think that case may be the one where the stark contrast of how judges can view facts differently became very apparent to me. I mean, two people can see a youngster walking down the street, let's say a young, like 11-year-old girl in the middle of the day, and one of them will say, you know, why isn't she at school? Uh, and the other one will say, um, oh, she's going to the store doing an errand for her mother. People perceive things differently, and I think judges are people too. And my point there in that case was that the jury should decide how that picture should be painted, instead of giving qualified immunity, which means that the, that the officers don't even have to stand 
uh, trial for the, for the civil rights violation, that it was so clear cut. My point was it's not that clear cut, and in fact, that's why we do have juries, because people do paint different pictures. And that's why the jury system is so fantastic, because as the evidence unfolds, each of these jurors is painting those pictures and arriving at, at facts on their own. Um, but you know, judges do come to the bench with different perspectives, and to deny that is crazy. I mean, I'm a product of my environment. I was a civil lawyer. I was never in the criminal law. Uh, and I like to think I look at facts very objectively, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Justice Alito, on the other hand, having been a prosecutor. No, but I mean, they do color your view, which, which is why I thought the jury should have decided that case. So what happens in conference, if you can tell us, and I'm not asking necessarily about this case, although if you're happy to uh, tell us about this case, what goes on in conference in these kind of circumstances where people have diametrically different views of facts, probably happened to Jones, that's what Judge Jones is talking about in cases that were before him. What, well, what goes on there? You say to your colleagues, I see it differently. It's this as that. I see it differently. And you point up the facts that you think go towards your, your point. And in this particular case, my point was when they got on the scene and showed this aggression, and yet it was peaceful. And, and in fact, the, the owner of the house, I think, said, we knew you were coming, so we hid all the weapons, because we didn't want anything to happen. Well, when that happens, then it dispels. Put your gun away. Take them away in the paddy wagon, but don't keep you know, hitting people. So, so you argue the facts to your colleagues. And sometimes you can persuade other colleagues. And I've had situations where that happens, where you point out the things and they, they say, oh, you know, you're right. But it is, you know, it's, it is about the facts and it is about the law. And it, it's not so much about where I want this. I didn't want this case to go a certain way. Right. That wasn't the point. The point was, how do we give a fair shot given the facts and the law? But I, I guess that, that works when you're sitting on an appellate panel, as, as the both of you uh, are or have. Um, what about when you're a district judge and you don't have that ability, or a trial judge in Judge Cleveland's case, you don't have that ability to get that other view? Well, you do. You've got the lawyers. The lawyers are going to give you that view. Yeah, but they've got skin in the game. They, well, they, have they a... do, but you don't. That's the point. They have skin in the game. One says this. One says this is the way the facts should be shown. The other one says this is the way the, the facts should be viewed. And then you decide, but you decide based upon which, which side is right. Not, oh, I'm going to do justice. I want it to come out this way. No, you do it based on the facts and the law. And I know in your book, there's a lot of stories of, that judges tell about the record, that a record is made, a record of evidence in the, I mean, Vaughn Walker, uh, you know, and the, the case that the, the Prop 8 case that went to the, uh, before him, I mean, the record was was the key determining factor, not which way he wanted it to come out. Judge Cleland, do you ever talk to other judges when you have a difficult case before you to get that other kind of opinion that Judge uh, Rendell is talking about, or maybe Judge Jones is talking about? Well, not about the about the specifics of any particular case, but we certainly. Why not? Well, I think that would be inappropriate uh, to, to talk about how I ought to solicit advice about how I ought to rule on a particular case. That's my responsibility. Uh, but in terms of the general concepts of the law or procedural issues, sure, that we all have an obligation to, to educate each other, judges and lawyers. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously, I guess everybody in the room probably knows that you presided over the Sandusky case, one of the worst sexual abuse scandals in the United States. Um, I read some about it when, when it was going on. I read a little more in preparation for this evening, and I looked at the sentencing statement that you gave in that case. And I suspect you're going to tell me, as most judges will, um, that I treated that case no differently than any other case. Are you going to tell me that? No. <laughs> so in that, in that case, well, very honest. Everybody told me you were an honest man. And I, I told uh, Judge Cleland's grandchildren who were here that I was going to, I was trash talking them, that I was going to really beat up uh, Judge Cleland today. I can see already that's not going to happen. Uh, so, Judge Cleland, what did you do differently, and, and, and why did you do it differently, uh, other than obviously the reason the whole world was watching? 
Well, I, th I think a trial is, a, is an opportunity for public education. And it's an opportunity for, for the country, for the citizens to see how our system works, what, the, what it means to have a rule of law, not to have lynch mobs go to the jail and pull people out and hang them, but we have processes, we have procedures, we have juries, and that the rule of law is something that has to be protected, that people have to understand what that is in order to protect it and appreciate it. And this was a for better or worse, an opportunity to educate the public about that system and that process. But in doing that, you were doing different things. I read your sa uh, sentencing statement, which was beautiful under the circumstances, given what you were dealing with, and um, they were clearly not extemporaneous remarks. No. What were you trying to do besides educate society as to what happened in that case? What, what were you trying to do by that sentencing statement? Well, of course, I have to comply with the law. I have sure. to explain uh, what the sentence is, how it was calculated, what factors went into it. But beyond that, uh, I, I think it was important to acknowledge the victims and, and to, to, to uh, let them know that they had been heard, that they'd been understood, that, that, uh, that uh, even though they were the victims of a very serious crime, that they didn't need to think of themselves as victims that in some ways uh, they could uh, uh, think of themselves as, as heroes. Uh, so it was important to speak to the victims. Uh, I, I think it was important to explain to the public uh, the nature of sexual offending. Uh, because there is this perception that uh, if you see a sexual offender, everybody would recognize it. Well, that's not the case. I've handled lots and lots of sexual offense cases. And uh, very frequently, they are the kind of trusted individuals that would not rise, raise suspicion. And so for, so in terms of the people who lived in State College, uh, I think it was important to try to explain to the public that these were not evil people, uh, that, that uh, uh, they, were not morally deficient because they didn't appreciate and recognize this conduct and behavior. So that was going on. There were a lot of things sort of floating through that sentencing statement. Okay, I, I asked Judge Chin, who now sits on the Second Circuit, he was the judge who sat on the district court, who was a colleague of Judge Rakoff's, who basically, um, he sentenced uh, Bernie Madoff to 150 years. And I asked Judge Chin in, in his interview in my book, why didn't you tell uh, Madoff, I want to sentence you long enough that you will never see the light of day for the horrible crimes that he committed? And I would say the same. Why didn't you do that with Sandusky for the horrible crimes that he committed? You were saying very important things in terms of victims, and, and I'm sure the, the community appreciated that greatly. I appreciate it as an outsider. Why, why didn't you say what I would have thought needed to be said? Hey, pal, you're never going to see the light of day as long as I'm a judge around here. Well, I think I did say that. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I did say that uh, the 30 to 60 year sentence uh, was sent the unmistakable message for the, for the rest of his life. But you didn't seem angry when you did that. Were you angry? I hope not. Well, what's wrong with that? I've asked Judge Chin that, and, and you're here. Why, why is it wrong for a judge who feels an anger, you probably felt an anger for his conduct, whether you showed it on the bench or not is a different thing, but I guess anybody who heard that conduct would be angry. Why don't you say it? I'm angry at you, and basically society needs to be um, told about it and direct, I'm the guy who's being the person who should be telling it to you. Well, I guess it's, it's sort of the same reason why you don't want to go to the emergency room and have a doctor say, I don't like the sight of blood. I mean, it, there's, a, there's a professional <laughs> distance that, that has to be maintained in order to, uh, not that emotion is involved, but it has to be sort of extracted, squeezed out somehow, because this is a process of rationality, not vengeance. Mm -hmm. Judge Rakoff, I'll get back to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Judge Jones, um, You've handled two very um, important uh, constitutional cases in the last couple of years. One was the Kitzmiller case, which involved uh, you holding that the teaching of intelligent design in the public school would have been unconstitutional. And you more recently handled one of the same-sex marriage cases where you declared the Pennsylvania law unconstitutional. 
you seem, in terms of your judging, to do something beyond the judging itself. You want to say things in your opinions, as you certainly did in the Kitzmiller case, and you certainly did um, in the um, same-sex marriage case. I'll pull it out, your precise words, at the end of the opinion. But it seems to me that you want to be communicating further beyond what's going on in your courtroom. Am I right? Some would take issue with that. Um, I, I think that uh, some of my colleagues would not write that way, would not write opinions. But w why are you writing it? I, I think it was the nature of the cases. You, you might not find that in every opinion uh, that I write. Uh, they, were, they were big, uh, hairy uh, cases that were steeped in uh, controversy. And um, I felt that I was writing for a broader audience, uh, not just for the parties and for counsel and that it was necessary to write clearly, um, hopefully in a concise way, at least in most parts of the opinion, uh, and, and in a way that, that um, was, was digestible and understandable to laypersons as well as to, uh, to lawyers. But, you, but like I say, you make editorial comments talking about we being a better people than the mm -hmm. law as presently uh, is shows that's saying more than being clear about what you're doing. Well, you're, it, was you're, in, it was in the conclusion uh, to the opinion. And if you, if you take the opinion uh, as a whole, it, it, it didn't drive the analysis. And, and you know, to, to loop that back into the analysis, which I thought was, was clear, that was a due process and equal protection case, uh, w would be wrong. Now, if you conflate it uh, and, and, and if you apprehend that it drove the, the the conclusions in the opinion, it, it, it did not. Um, and again, reasonable people may differ. Uh, I, you know, I, perhaps I, I don't prefer the drier style. And that's not what you get. Uh, uh, it didn't get it with either of those opinions. You, you were criticized uh, after the Kitzmiller decision by some of the conservative uh, 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 think tank folks, including Phyllis Shafley, who um, said, what, did, what the hell did this guy do to us? Um, we put him on the bench. Right. Um, <laughs> and you sort of forfended against that in some of the language that you said. Well, I, I, I predicted that I would be called an activist judge, um, and I was. Uh, that's, that's precisely uh, what the uh, uh, conclusion of Shafley, you name them, Ann Coulter, uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh, I got it from everybody um, in a, of that ilk. Um, you, you, and that's an interesting experience because that goes to assumptions that the, that the, the punditry has, uh, one of which is that uh, judges are beholden, in the case of district judges uh, and perhaps uh, appellate judges, to the individual who appointed them, um, and that you have to be true to your school. Uh, and, and come down in a way that, uh, that perhaps uh, they predict uh, that you would. And I joke that, um, uh, and this is true for, I, I think, any of us who are appointed, I, I, I thought my name was changed uh, from U.S. District Judge Jones to Bush appointed uh, Judge Jones <laughs> um, in order to make a point. The interesting thing is that Judge Jones then used his notoriety from that case to talk about the independence of the judiciary. And you know he was on the Times top 100, and stuff, but everywhere he went, that was his theme, that this is not what we do. We do not promote an agenda. We decide cases as they come before it. And so the, the lesson of his, you know, his editorializing, if you will, actually had huge educational value for the people that, that he connected with in a way that judges don't do. We don't talk about what we do, and people don't understand what we do, but he had that that opportunity and used it in a, in a great way. No wonder why you told me I should make sure that Judge Rendell is on this panel. <laughs> <laughs>
So I rigged Rendell, the panel. <laughs> Judge Rendell, apropos Thank that, you, um, you were involved. I'll get to you, Judge Rakoff. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't, feel, don't feel compelled. <laughs> yeah, the clock's ticking. You're doing it. Judge Rendell, you were, you were on um, a decision um, re resulting from Janet Jackson's performance um, um, on a Super Bowl. Nine sixteenths of a second. Um, and um, that was referred to, I think, by Justice Timberlake as a wardrobe malfunction. But it's referred to uh, by a group called the Parents Television Council as Janet Jackson's striptease um, and indecency. And basically, you uh, ruled in favor of CBS, saying that the FCC had gone too far in terms of its punishment right. of CBS. I think it was a $500,000 fine. Did, did you get, beside that press release by the uh, uh, um, uh, Parent Teachers yeah. Council referring to this as um, um, judicial stupidity and a sucker punch to people everywhere or something like that, um, you get hate mail for that well, kind of To case? the point that people don't understand what we do, I did get hate mail when we finally you know, up or, or cast the, said the FCC could not find CBS, but the, the whole story of the case was based upon the fact that the FCC had changed policies midstream in a way that under the law you're not allowed to do. So we slapped them on the wrist and said the $50,000 fine was wrong. Well, I got hate mail, people saying, how dare you say what Janet Jackson did was just fine. You know, it was horrible, and that's not what I did. Folks, that's not what I did. But um, yeah, we have a tough time being, being understood in terms of what we do. So Judge Rakoff, um, <laughs> so I have referred to you uh, occasionally as the bete noir of the uh, Securities Exchange Commission, and you have been somewhat harsh with them um, over the years, and you've held up major settlements of theirs that were agreed to by Bank of America and then uh, Citigroup. And um, ultimately, and to your credit, you, you changed the way um, the SEC deals with cases in, in terms of they're not agreeing to these uh, neither affirm nor deny settlements in cases. But you have done more than your deciding cases in your courtroom. You have written some pretty strident words in the New York Review of Books a couple of times. And I came across just the other day a speech that you gave at the um, Practicing Law Institute in New York, which you were complimentary to the SEC and made it very clear that they were trying to do um, the important work that they were doing. But at the end of it, you said this. Um, I see no good, what, what your what grievance was there was they're taking too many courses, that, uh, too many cases that they were handled as enforcement proceedings rather than bringing them to the federal courts. And you said in conclusion, I see no good reason to displace that constitutional alternative with administrative fiat, and I would urge the SEC to consider that it is neither in its own long-term interest, nor in the interest of the securities markets, nor in the interest of the public as a whole for the SEC to become, in effect, a law unto itself. Those are pretty strong words, Judge Rakoff. And no, I'm not sure. for me. Uh. <laughs> Touche. Touche. <laughs> so actually, before I answer your implicit question, I, I do want to say that to me it's, it's thrilling uh, to be here because I was born and raised in Philadelphia, and uh, this is a city that is um, just immersed in history, and, and, and uh, I think the judiciary is immersed in our historic role um, so it, it is really great to be back here. The only thing that was unfortunate is this guy from New York followed me down here. But, uh, <laughs> um, so I think one of the roles of a judge is to comment on ways in which the development of the law can be improved. Uh, the judicial ethics of the federal judiciary approves judges doing just uh, that. Uh, the, uh, that's not our first role. Our first role is to be impartial. We were, you were talking before about uh, how life's experiences can affect you, and it's, that, that unquestionably is true. But, but I think all the judges here uh, understand that 
when you take that oath to be impartial, and when you put on that robe and assume the role of a judge, um, you, part of that is um, uh, overcoming um, what might be uh, uh, ancillary aspects of your background and doing your very, very level best to decide the case uh, on the merits uh, impartially and neutrally. And I think um, the, uh, I, I think many people outside the judiciary do not understand how uh, sacred that role is to judges. Uh, this, is, this is what we swore we were going to do. Um, and I think the vast, vast majority of judges uh, do their level best uh, to, to do that and to be impartial and neutral because that's, that's part of their job, maybe the central part of their job. A secondary part of the job, but not, I think, unimportant, is to suggest ways in which the law can be improved, not policy issues, which are not for the judiciary on the whole, uh, not uh, personal preferences, but there are times when um, a development in uh, a regulatory agency or a development elsewhere in our government also impacts the development of the law. So in the particular instance you were talking about, uh, it seems to me that historically the securities laws uh, have been developed by the federal courts and the SEC has referred to the federal courts uh, the more difficult and more important issues in the development of the securities laws. And I think it would be unfortunate uh, if they chose instead to uh, uh, keep that development mostly internal. Uh, we give in our country uh, an amazing amount of deference to regulatory agencies uh, and uh, to a remarkable extent uh, we uh, let them determine what the law is in their particular areas. And that may be a good thing or a bad thing, but in this particular area, um, uh, the securities laws, most of the law has been developed by the judges uh, over uh, a period of decades. Uh, and I think, uh, and all I was trying to suggest in that particular uh, uh, talk was that that is a good development be precisely because judges are neutral. They don't have the same ax to grind that a regulatory agency sometimes has. Um, and the securities laws is an area where, at least in the Southern District of New York, uh, the judges have at least equal expertise uh, to the regulatory agency because of this historical uh, referral. Um, and it seemed to me that therefore this was an, uh, um, a topic on which it was appropriate for a judge to speak out. So, but Judge Cleland seems to do his talking in terms of the sentencing process in the courtroom. Isn't there a way for you to do what some would, it, it, being the devil's advocate here, and some of my friends would say the devil is well represented, um, <laughs> can't you do what you're doing in this other marketplace of ideas in the courtroom and avoid that kind of criticism that you might receive, and Judge Jones, you might receive for having you know, gone to the public in terms of some of your views on, on the constitutionality of same-sex marriage or, or um, intelligent design. I, I don't see that as, as a dilemma. They, there are cases, um, as was referred to, that raise important issues of more, if you will, social importance, but those are relatively few. Um, are, uh, it would be inappropriate, in my view, to take a case that uh, was just a, 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 an everyday routine case and make that the uh, occasion for some uh, dictum from the bench about some uh, broader issue. Um, so I do think there is a perfectly appropriate role um, for judges to speak out on issues that impact the development of the law, not other issues, but those kind of issues. And, so John? and, and that, well, there is a distinction uh, that, that's important. And it, it, you know, what I what I haven't done, what I won't do, uh, is is to go out and and, and try to 
uh, expand upon a decision that I've already written. I mean, that's, we, I think we can all agree that's bad form, and that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the process, and as Judge Rendell said, how judges work, how, how they operate. And I think you can use experiences that we've had uh, as, as opportunities uh, to enlighten uh, the, the public. And I think it's perfectly all right in, in the case of Judge Rakoff to talk about areas of the law that, that, that he believes need to be talked about, but not necessarily in the context uh, of, a, of a case that he's written on. Uh, you know, I, I often said about the intelligent design case, it's 139 pages, the opinion. If you can't get it in 139 pages, I don't know what I can possibly <laughs> say, uh, you know, to help you, uh, uh, you know, or 39 pages in the same-sex marriage case. So th there's a distinction, and, and I, I, you know, we, we ought not be uh, issuing apologias for, uh, or, or explanations for decisions that ought to stand on their own. Judge Jones, did you want to be heard on that? I thought you were... I recall a, a comment made by the late uh, Judge Irving Kaufman of the Second Circuit uh, some time ago when he said that uh, silence is not always golden, even for judges. There comes a time, when, I think, when judges have an obligation to speak out, if not orally, uh, in, their, uh, in their writing in the form of concurrences or, or dissents. And one area where I think the many judges have uh, defaulted is with the, uh, uh, the sentencing guidelines and the uh, disparities in the sentencing for cr uh, crack and powder cocaine. The war on drugs has, uh, in many cases, judges have, uh, if not been complicit, have failed to recognize in, 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 in reality uh, in, in the law, what they know as human beings. The um, disparities in law enforcement and uh, uh, the sentencings that stripped judges of the independence that judges should have in imposing punishment has led to what um, Michelle Alexander has written in her tremendous book, The New Jim Crow, and tremendous disparities and so, with social consequences that affect all of us. And now we've come sort of full circle. Even Congress has now taken a new look. The sentencing guideline, the sentencing commission has, has been pushing Congress to reduce that, uh, that disparity from 101, from 100 to one uh, powder and crack to, uh, to a closer range. And I, I always, I attempted when I was on the court to persuade my colleagues to go with the law. If, if the precedent requires a certain result, okay, but state your, state your concerns, state, your, state your, your, your reasons. That's a form of education that will have an effect that will eventually bring about a change. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, it, in, in fact, we, we see the same kind of thinking with regard to uh, uh, civil rights, whether it's school desegregation, uh, voting rights. We, we now see retro, retrogression. And one of the reasons, it wasn't the dominant reason, but one of the reasons I left the court was I felt I could, I could speak more freely. And I, re I, I wanted to regain my First Amendment rights so I could um, articulate the deep concerns I had because I saw the, sh the direction in which we were going. And I think there is that clear obligation on the part of judges. I used to tell my colleagues on, in cases of sentencing guidelines, I'd say, you know, they don't need us. Uh, let the government invest in some computers, put them on the bench, and let the U.S. attorney walk up and put the ticket in, hit the buttons, and out will come the sentence. Because if you, if you take away from the judges the indi their independence, the, the power to look at a defendant and consider mitigating factors, you are depriving that judge of his or her independence. When I was an assistant U.S. attorney in the Northern District of Ohio, the custom was on the afternoon before sentencing, the judge, all, all the judges did it. 
they would invite the probation officer and the U.S. attorney into his chambers to discuss the pre-sentence report and uh, help the judge decide what the sentence should be. The, outs the person on the outside was the defendant and his lawyer and her lawyer. They had no, no, no buy in it at, at all. And I used to say, this is very unfair. And the judge would say, well, if you don't like it, don't come in. <laughs> uh, but now that, is, that has changed, uh, but it's gone to another extreme. So I think uh, there is a clear obligation on the part of judges, and I can say this because I'm, I took a walk, um, it's a clear obligation to, to uh, be true to your oath. And if it means stand alone, you stand alone. I, are you saying that you can only say that because you took a walk? You couldn't say that when you're on the bench? I, I'd like to actually... Somebody's actually going to disagree here? No, no, no. I, I just want to supplement what, what oh, Judge no. Jones said, because I'm not sure everyone in the audience uh, is as familiar with the sentencing guidelines and the, and the uh, ratio that he's referring to. So the great irony here is that one of the original justification of the sentencing guidelines was that they would do away uh, or at least minimize racial disparities. And the irony was they imposed a great racial disparity across the board. And the way that came across was uh, they, the, it was decided, and this was mostly from pressure from Congress. It's not the Sentencing Commission really doesn't bear primary responsibility here. Congress does. They determined that uh, crack cocaine, even though chemically identical to powder cocaine, should be given a 100 to 1 ratio so that in calculating the weight of the drug, which is under the sentencing guidelines, is by far the biggest determiner of the sentence, or sentence which is a problem in itself, um, that if you committed uh, a, an offense in which you uh, sold uh, one gram of crack cocaine, it would be treated for sensing purposes the same as if you sold 100 grams of powder cocaine, which meant the sense went hugely up. And since crack cocaine was mostly associated with people in the African American community, and powder cocaine was mostly associated with persons in the white and Hispanic communities, the result was a huge racial disparity uh, in sentencing. Um, and uh, the reason I wanted to expand on that is the person who first brought that to the attention of lawyers in New York was a sitting African-American judge on my court, Robert Carter, now deceased, uh, who gave a speech before the Federal Bar Council uh, and uh, exposed uh, this, this ridiculous ratio, which had no basis in science, which had no basis uh, in uh, any uh, rational approach, um, uh, but it was as a sitting judge that he first brought that to the attention of the New York Bar, and similar judges did so elsewhere. So I think that was a perfectly appropriate role of a judge to play. So Judge Cleland, since you're the only state judge on this panel, although there were obviously many of your colleagues in the audience, um, these folks uh, have life tenure. Uh, Judge Jones took a walk, as he says. Do you, do you have your one arm sort of tied behind your back in your ability to exercise um, judicial independence, which we're about tonight, uh, because you have to stand for a re-election? Well, that, that's a very interesting point, because um, the federal judiciary, I, I haven't seen the numbers recently, but they handle a very small fraction as a matter of fact, of litigation that goes on around the country, maybe I don't know, less than 10%. Um, the courts that really affect the lives of people day to day in their most intimate kind of relationships, divorce, custody, uh, automobile accidents, uh, uh, those, those sorts of business uh, climate cases, those are handled in state courts. And I'm not sure what the number is, but I think over 30 of the states elect their judges, which means that the whole concept of judicial independence takes on an entirely different context for state court judges 
than it does for judges who have the benefit of uh, uh, tenure during good behavior. Uh, so it is a different thing, and, and politics does play a role in it. And as the Chief Justice alluded to earlier, we've got three seats open, and, and every, I would predict, every influence group in Pennsylvania is going to want to have a voice in how those judges are selected, and uh, some expectation that those judges are going to uh, view favorably one side or the other. That's the reality of elected politics, elected judges. Um, this week, uh, the Supreme Court um, denied cert in a case, which actually is an appeal from a, a case of yours, Judge Rakoff, the Whitman case, which is a securities fraud case. And the Supreme Court denied cert, as I say, uh, but Justice Scalia, joined by um, Justice Thomas, um, basically raised a question as to whether the, the, it was an appropriate case um, for certiorari, which they both agreed it was not. But then they say, or Justice Scalia says, Whitman does not seek review on the issue of deference, uh, which is deference to the SEC standard in securities cases. And the procedural history of the case, in any event, makes it a poor setting in which to reach the question. So I agree with the court that we should deny the petition. But when a petition properly presenting the question comes before us, I will be receptive to granting it. So he is sort of like that judge sitting next to me at the federal bar lunch, just bring me a case. So my question to, to all of you is, although uh, Judge Jones wasn't helping me out the first time around, um, do you folks sit around saying, at least to yourselves, bring me a case that you want to be the judge on a particular case? Well, you're assuming that that's really what Scalia was saying. But he might have been saying, there is a circuit split. And this needs to be decided. And we need to give guidance to the lower courts. But this just isn't the case to do it. So, Or I I'm right. <laughs> 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 That's right. Do we know if there's a circuit split? Well, uh, if we got Justice Scalia today right here, I'm sure he'd tell us. You know, he'd, yeah, he'd tell us. <laughs> so, just, uh, Judge Rakoff, you don't sit around saying, gee, I hope I get that case? No. I, I don't I, mean this I, case. I mean a the, case. The, uh, I, I think the reality of it is that um, you are um, not displeased when you get an important case. Uh, all of us have, you know, enough uh, ego to to uh, feel, you know, gee, you know, I thought about it, and there's no better judge than me to decide that case. <laughs> uh, well, but also, you'd, but rather, you'd rather read a good book than a bad book. Right, right. So, you know, <laughs> but, in a case, but it's a good no thing. one goes. I don't think anyone goes looking for cases and 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 saying, gee, I've got this great message that I want to get out there, and and I hope the the case. Uh, comes my way, and and actually um, sometimes it can be, you know, the the, the last thing you want is um, a high notoriety case. Um, so when I had been on the bench, come about, on. Sometimes you the last thing you want is a high notoriety. Well, I'm going to give you an example. They so I'd been on the bench about a year, and the. Uh, Knicks were in the playoffs against the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know and, um, and, and they were ahead two to nothing. And uh, then there was a big brawl, and uh, all their major players got off the bench uh, and joined the brawl. And then they got all suspended immediately, which meant inevitably it was, uh, to the Miami Heat. And uh, the players. Uh, uh, were able to bring it to into federal court because it was a they're unionized and uh, uh, the federal courts have jurisdiction over union matters. And um, the, uh, that morning, uh, the uh, law clerk, one of my law clerks, said, uh, "My husband says uh, he hopes you get the case, and if you do, you better decide for the Knicks." Or or else. I, the law clerk, can't come home tonight. Um, so uh, anyway, I did get the case, and I had it decided that day. 
and I ruled against the Knicks, um, and uh, that made me very unpopular. And I called up my wife and I said, you know, I'm already getting nasty uh, phone calls. And so forth. Uh, and Don't answer the door. I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to come home. And she says, well, I've discussed it with your daughter. We don't think you should come home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I will tell you that, you know, there are cases and there are cases. And that brings to mind at the same time I was dealing with one of the cases that you've mentioned that I had, I also had a case in my docket, for example, that was a patent case involving the, the type, the composition of, of, and I'm making this up, of the ink that is used to mark organs for removal before they're taken out by physicians. Now, which case, Joel, do you think I found <laughs> more, more interesting you know, at that time? So, I, I agree with my colleagues. I don't, I don't think we wish for specific cases, but I don't think that we're displeased when we have an opportunity to, to, to get our teeth into a, a substantial case. Because after all, I, I think, I hope that all of us would say that that's why we sought these jobs, uh, to, to have the opportunity uh, to take a swing at those cases if they arrive on our dockets. Does somebody want to add something to that? Um, uh, let me say this, uh, uh, this um, past year and a half I've been involved in sort of a magical mystery tour going around the country interviewing judges. I never met John uh, Jones before. Uh, I've obviously met uh, Judge Rakoff before. You, you may have noticed uh, that he and I are sort of sparring partners or I get beat up all the time generally by him. Um, but I, I think a tribute it's to the way it should be. Uh, <laughs> Well, you have life tenure, my friend. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it is to me a, a tribute to the judiciary that folks like these five and others who I've met, I've interviewed um, 13 judges, two of them are here, Judge Rakoff and uh, Judge Jones, that they are doing something that judges have not done in the past, at least in, in, in my experience. And that is talking to the public or talking to me um, in a book where there are no holds barred to the interview, although I gave all of these folks um, advance notice that any question um, that I asked, and you can see I can sometimes ask invasive questions, any question I ask, you could take out. Any answer I, um, you give, you can take out, change, edit, remove, do whatever you want with it. Not one of the 13 judges did that. Uh, Judge Jones was good enough to say to me, and I took it as a high compliment, he says, I can't believe you got me to say that, but that's what an interview is about. It. And it's a tribute to the judiciary that they're behaving this way in terms of bringing to the public what the public needs to know about what's been previously a sort of secretive body where people think that the judiciary is a total mystery in terms of what goes on there. So I applaud all of you and thank you so much for participating in this.